show, I will have sort of provided an explainer on what this show is about, and the show is about climate change, right? Yes. Okay, <laughs> awesome. All right, cool. All right, so um, let's get started then. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, Minda, for joining us today. Uh, so can you give people a little bit of a background on, on who you are and, and, and what you're working on? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. So my name is Minda Grubeko. I have a PhD in biology from Tufts University. Um, my background in research is studying um, how terrestrial systems like forests and agricultural systems are going to respond to climate change. And I started working at the National Center for Science Education this past year because they've expanded into uh, defending the teaching of climate change science in public classrooms. And so if we can talk more about what that means and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And and Pamela, you know, you're obviously an astronomer by training, also a PhD astronomer. Uh, so what impact does climate change have on on your work? Um it's one of those things where it's it's really quite varied. It's everything from observatory sites that once upon a time when the site studies were done didn't really have very much cloud cover, maybe a few nights a year, now have many nights a year. It it changes the humidity in the atmosphere which ex which uh, changes how well we can observe in infrared bands. Uh, but then there's also the, the concerns that arise just as a regular human being where climate change has the potential to kind of change where you should be living, uh, how we should be growing things, and whether or not we should be abusing Amazon Prime. Um, right. I mean, I think it's been a, a, a massive education, sort of, you know, a massive Im impact on our science education, on the way we communicate science. I mean, that for me has been one of the biggest kind of wake up calls on the way this all works is the reaction, the way we've had to sort of take this stuff, you know, head on on our blogs and and, and so on. So first, let's let's go into this before we get into the controversy. Let's let's just go into the science here. So. So, Minda, can you kind of explain to people who maybe have no idea sort of what's going on, what is the underlying science behind the climate change that, that we're seeing? Oh, well, very simply put, um, you know, so climate, one of the big arguments um, that people have in climate change is what's the evidence and, um, well, climate's changed so much over the past, you know, how, how do we know what's happening now and so on. And the more I talk to climate scientists, the more it becomes just really evident that there's multiple um, uh, different types of evidence that are pointing to us to the fact that the climate now is really changing and it's because of humans um, and it's changing in a much shorter time span than it ha ever has in the past. Um, and it really has to do with the release of greenhouse gases by people um, and by combustion of fossil fuels which is um, trapping more heat in our atmosphere and um, causing the, the earth to warm. And there are many repercussions of that. And as a biologist, I've spent a lot of time looking at the biological repercussions, but there's a lot of physical and chemical changes that go along with that as well to the earth's atmosphere and um, and physical structures on the earth and stuff like that. The ocean. And, and this whole concept of greenhouse gases is really one that I know a lot of people are confused by. Um, and and it, it's, it confuses them because, well, how is the light getting to Earth? Why, why is it that it can get here and it can't escape? And, and the issue is, what color is it that's getting to the Earth? Our sun is radiating light at us in a whole variety of different colors. And it's the, the optical colors and some of the radio waves that get through the Earth's atmosphere and we're able to enjoy them here on the surface of the planet. They keep us warm, they keep us alive. The UV is a bad thing. That's, again, caused in part by bad things we've done to the atmosphere. Um, but by and large, the, the colors of light that are coming down are, are a whole variety that span from beyond the blue into the ultraviolet all the way down into certain bands beyond the red into the infrared and even beyond that into the radio. And this light is all hitting the surface of our planet. The planet warms up. Because it is warm, it is re-radiating energy in the infrared. Prior to building up all these greenhouse gases, this infrared light that the ground is releasing was able to radiate up through the atmosphere and escape our planet and go off into space. You could look at the planet Earth and we glowed nicely in the infrared, even on the side of the planet the sunlight wasn't reflecting off of. Well, nowadays, uh, we're still glowing in the infrared, but not all of the light 
that would have gotten off the planet in the past is getting off today. Right, and, and this is because the increased carbon dioxide is is stopping as it's much insulating of the insulating us. It's in, stop as much of that infrared radiation from escaping back into space. So, so Minda, we're in in this horrible situation where we're building up these greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I guess what impact is this increase in carbon dioxide having on the, on the temperature? What is the, co the connection between the two? Are you looking to me or are you looking to Pamela? <laughs> yeah, to, to, to you. To you. Oh, yeah. So, so what the impact is is that it traps more, um, more heat on the Earth. And, and so what the impact is is that both the, the terrestrial Earth as well as the oceans end up warming. And so the impact is, first of all, foremost, people think about climate change and they think of, well, the temperature is going to increase. So that's, that's really just one piece of what's changing. So when you increase greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you also increase it in the ocean. And yeah. so you change the pH of the ocean, you're changing the ocean's chemistry. And so everything living in the ocean is going to have to change because of that, because you're changing their environment. And everything on the Earth that depends on carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, it will be impacted as well. And then there are other components as well because, well, temperature can change um, the water cycle. And so you might actually experience changes in, in rainfall and snowfall. And these are the types of things we've already started to see. Out here in California, we're expecting another really horrible drought year <laughs> this summer, which, yeah. um, you know, is, is really problematic because we're a major agricultural state. And so it, it goes beyond just the, the warming component. It, that's just the first piece of this larger impact that we're seeing and we're going to see in the future. Uh, now, I know we just passed, was it the 400 parts per million right. line? Yeah. Yeah. Which I think just in the last, what, this year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So, so when people say like that, you know, the the four hundred parts per million, what is that sort of, Minda? What is that that number? And what is its significance? And sort of, you know, yeah. put that give us a sense of scale on that. Well, you know, the four, you know, in some ways, the four hundred parts per million was a little bit arbitrary, but it was sort of a a point that um, researchers and scientists, as well as politicians, sort of put like, let's cap it. You know, if we can stay under four hundred parts per million, then and maybe we won't um, start to see some of the more um, devastating and harsher effects of climate change. Um, so there was a lot of push sort of politically to try to get um, our infrastructure to change in order to keep it below that amount. And um, so when we hit 400, it was sort of this like, okay, we have a serious problem. So the implications obviously are, are for uh, the natural systems as well. But but really, the 400 was a was sort of a a, a deadline that w that we set for ourselves. Like, let's try to keep it under this, and um, and we failed. So <laughs> it was sort of a politically devastating kind of moment for I think a lot of people who are trying to to work to manage climate change. And and I've heard people in in the public argue that. Well, if the pH D, if the pH changes, they can adapt. But what we're looking at in some cases, um, if the temperature changes, they can move. Mm -hmm. Coral reefs is one of the great examples um, of of. I know I have killed more fish due to being bad at chemistry than <laughs> any other reason. And and could you maybe talk about some of these real world consequences we're facing? Yeah, I mean, I think people like to talk a lot about coral reefs, but it, it really goes way beyond that. Um, I think people don't really recognize that the um, the ocean, I mean, if you're living in the ocean, you're surrounded by water all the time, you're, you're highly adapted to whatever environment you are there, you're in there. And if you change the pH, um, making the ocean more acidic, it's almost like if we were walking around and we made the air more acidic, you know, what would the effect be on your skin? What would your effect be on... Um, the sensory organs of fish and that sort of thing that depend on actually um, the pH of the water. Um, so there's actually far-ranging impacts. And what's interesting as a scientist, you know, is to be able to ask, okay, how does this pH um, difference actually going to impact all these organisms in the ocean? Um, but then when you read the studies, it's actually quite scary. And so the impacts can be on reproduction. They can be on um, sensory abilities, like I mentioned. They can be on just fundamental survival, so shelled organisms that, um, uh, well, I won't get into the specific science of it, but basically um, a more acidic uh, uh, ocean water 
impacts their ability to build shells. And so if you like oysters and you like mussels and that sort of thing, then you know it's going to be a challenge for them to be building their, their shells. Um, and so the impacts go to sort of are high and expansive and really problematic. Now, there are those who argue that it, the planet goes through cycles, things yeah. change, and the thing that. is we have the ability through science to look back through tens of thousands of years of Earth's history. Yeah. So is this a cycle? Well, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the Earth does go through these long-ranging natural cycles, but we're talking on the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Um, and what we're seeing is on a really short time scale. And so um, many people have asked the question. This isn't like a question that researchers haven't asked. They've, they've asked it many different ways and many different times. And the, the end result that everyone keeps coming back to is the fact that people are responsible. And because we're responsible, we need to take more responsibility for that <laughs> and actually do something about it. Yeah. Um, but no, this isn't, this isn't part of a natural cycle. This is, you know, humans, we humans having this. an impact. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a journalist, I found the sort of the whole controversy quite surprising to me. I mean, I've been reporting on existential threats to humanity for, mm -hmm. you know, for a decade. And, you know, like I love to talk about how asteroids are going to kill us all and, you know, yeah. other kinds of really big risks that we, that we face. And so, you know, as I was reporting on, say, even the ozone hole, there was no real controversy. Like, yes, absolutely, hole in the ozone layer, we've got to fix that or we're going to have some problems. And, you know, every story that we reported on, we didn't really get a lot of controversy other than people offering suggestions or, you know, mm -hmm. pointing to references to other links or other research documents. But when we started to report on global warming as a, you know, and this is like, you know, maybe eight, nine years ago even, um, and right away, it felt like there was this really weird, organized resistance that was very coordinated and yeah. was, was very uh, almost trollish in, in behavior. So, so, you know, I mean, for you also were kind of reporting on this and sort of dealing with the, the, the communications of this. You know, why do you sort of think that the, that the response to global warming has been so uh, volatile? And it's compared denialist. to yeah the denialist response as a, you know as opposed to the mm -hmm. other kinds of you know, equally uh, you know as I said existential threat type things that face humanity you know I mean think about uh, uh, immunization and uh, you know disease resistance and all these things are big big problems and yet for some reason global warming people just go crazy about it. Yeah, that's a really good question, and um, I just spent this past week at, actually at a, a conference in Colorado where it was climate scientists and educators and communication specialists who kind of all came together to talk about, you know, why, well, how is this different? And I think there were a couple things we, we talked about. First of all, science denial does exist in other areas. If you think about vaccines and that sort of thing, people being really resistant to that. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. Evolution is a very good example of science denial. So, it's not necessarily just climate change um, being sort of picked out of all these other issues. Science denial happens in many different avenues. Um, why climate change in particular? Well, originally it seems like it started um, basically in response to concern from um, certain entities about their financial stake. So basically if climate change is real and it's caused by humans um, burning fossil fuels, then that has that could have potentially economic implications for um, certain companies and certain groups, and that's certainly very threatening. And so, as and if you sort of look at people's acceptance of the science of climate change over time, it was really going up, 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 up. People were really starting to understand it, and then all of a sudden, it just it sort of collapsed, and it collapsed right around the time when a lot of misinformation started being produced. And a lot of it originally seems to have come from the fossil fuel industry um, originally. But now it's really expanded into coming from a lot of different um, free market um, uh, like think tanks and that sort of thing. And in terms of the educational material that I see getting sent into the classroom, those tend to come more from those think tank groups. So it's, it's really expanded out of that and into different avenues. and. Yeah, and, and now it's sort of everywhere and it's sort of flourished. This
climate change denial. And I, I have some friends that, that work in green energy that, that are activists to, to try and spread the idea of responsible living. And one of the things that I, I learned in conversing with them is the things that we need to do to uh, best protect ourselves from increasing the greenhouse gases are things that are simply inconvenient. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to fly planes less, stay home more, use internet technologies to communicate more. We need to lay off with the overnight delivery and rely on the uh, much better for the environment freight delivery. Uh, mm -hmm. Trains really are the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, by local, not global, um, all of these things help in their own way by reducing the amount of emission that emission that's required to ship things and to ship things fast. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, a lot of changes that we've seen. So, so the U.S. actually. Um, has done a good job increasing its energy efficiency, even though I know we like to be very critical of the U.S. and certainly we could do a lot more. A lot of the reductions that we've seen have come from people being more um, aware of, okay, where am I getting my food from? Maybe I don't need it shipped all the way from Chile <laughs> or something like that. Um, maybe I can eat a little bit more locally or maybe um, I can just walk to the bookstore and get a book or something like that. But also, you know, insulating your house has a, a huge impact. Re deciding to ride your bike to work instead of driving your car, it's like these little things and they really build up and they make a big difference. And and they actually improve your quality of life, they just don't improve your efficiency. And somehow we got away from the idea of high quality and got on to the trend of fast. And I'm just as guilty of this as everyone else. <laughs> um, it, it's so much healthier and tastes better to buy local food that is in season rather than to get hothouse tomatoes shipped from the other part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and and you're right, it's the walking, it's the bike riding, it's, it's adopting a, a more outdoor healthy power yourself way of living. Now, now, what impact do you think this controversy's had on science communication? Because I, you know, it feels like like I've wasted a lot of time dealing with these issues. Like, it feel like like I could be talking about the awesomeness of space and the really cool, you know, missions that are going on, and you know, we could be blowing people's minds with the wonders of the universe. And instead, we are rehashing these boring arguments on the blog that each one has been debunked a thousand times already but it's time to debunk it again you know what impact do you think that's had on on science communication over the last few years I think it's it's really terrible actually and I, I think it's intentional you know it really comes off as um, as an attempt to kind of waste people's time because particularly when it comes to the researchers themselves um, are they going to be doing research or should they be spending their time debunking this misinformation that's out there and the challenge I think for them is well first of all someone on the internet is wrong I have to do something about it we all need on our wall yeah. exactly but I mean fundamentally these researchers are dependent on uh, grants which are dependent on public support and ultimately if there's misinformation out there then there's a less likelihood of them getting grants based on uh, quality information and so on. And so it actually really does feed back. So one thing that I think is really great that has helped me be able to like move forward is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the website skepticalscience.com. Have you gone there before? Um, it's a really great website and they have like all of the climate denial arguments and they give really good um, scientifically based with peer-reviewed citations as to why that information is incorrect and um, uh, like what the right information is and that's great because then you can just link to that <laughs> and, and, and some of the Sorry, and some of the evidence that's out there is actually quite fun. Um, so, mm -hmm. so one of the things that people point out is we just need a big volcano to go off because it will put uh, mm -hmm. ash in the atmosphere that will block the light from getting to Earth. Well, what's neat is 
volcanoes going off help in more than one way. When the unpronounceable Icelandic volcano that begins with an E went off, yes, it threw ash into the atmosphere, which did help uh, block light from coming to the surface of the Earth. But it also had the effect of blocking hundreds of airplane flights. And while that led to many people sadly stranded in countries they didn't belong, it also greatly improved air quality. And uh, we could actually <laughs> see the, the measurements of the quality changing. So go volcanoes. Well, I think 2012, though, really brought climate change into the sort of living rooms and, you know, backyards of, of many Americans, especially. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2012 was a terrible year for drought and fires mm -hmm. and hurricanes and tornadoes and flooding and all of these things that have been sort of predicted in the models for, for mm -hmm. climate change. So, so from, I mean, from what I understand, sort of public sentiment about whether or not climate change is happening has changed quite significantly in even just the last year because they're just seeing the results all around them. It's really hard you to know, kind of escape it. That's really troubling to me, though, you know, because it, it's one of those situations where you don't want to be like, well, I was right, you know, and then there's this devastating hurricane or something like that. I mean, that's really, yeah. that's terrible. And so, you know, in some ways, I, you know, I wish that these events didn't happen because in one way, it brings, it brings climate change to the forefront. We have to talk about it. We have to address it because look at these major impacts. In the other sense, you just don't want these things to be happening um, to people. We don't want droughts. We don't want wildfires. We don't want large-scale hurricanes and that sort of thing um, impacting people. And so that's that's what's really very unfortunate about climate change is that... And Oh, sorry, go ahead. And, and I think this is the other side of, of the denialist. There's the economic side of uh, it, it will harm the it will harm parts of the economy to to yeah. make needed changes. But the other side is, I know I uh, back in uh, it was either very late 2002, early 2003. Friends who care about me took away my subscription to Science Magazine because there there had been an issue that had two unrelated teams. One was publishing uh, ocean current models where they took into account the salinity of the ocean and showed how the mid-ocean conveyor belts in the North Atlantic would shut down if the salinity of the water uh, was lowered by adding fresh water from melting glaciers. So mm -hmm. that was a model paper. Um, shut off the mid-ocean conveyor belts, you get cooling in the northern latitudes and heating in the equatorial latitudes. The, there was another journal article um, in, in this issue, again, completely unrelated team, where they were looking at uh, salinity measurements and they were looking at the rate of glacier melting and how that would change salinity measurements. And I sort of went on an, oh my God, salinity is changing, we're going to destroy northern Europe and Canada. And <laughs> it's, it was, it, like I said, people who love me took away my science. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, now, it, do you terrifying. think... Now, do you think that part of, you know, one of science's greatest advantages is the fact that, you know, it's it's always kind of looking for consensus. It's always, you know, building models and then trying to break them down. And it's never saying certainty. It's always just saying this is what, you know, this is, this is the model that the evidence best supports. And so in many cases, a scientist is very difficult to pin down and say, are you absolutely certain that, you <laughs> yeah. know, that, you never do that. that quasars <laughs> are, you know, are the yeah. actively feeding supermassive black holes? Well, you know, the models seem to suggest that, and, you know, yeah. and so like on the one hand, you have this sort of a, not a fondness for uncertainty, but a kind of a comfort with the fact that everything can that everything can change, the models can be turned upside down, that nothing is ever definitive, you're always looking to to tear down your own theories and other people's theories, and that's the way science moves forward. And then on and then that is battling against the exact opposite, looking for certainty, looking to kind of you know, and and so it's like it's science's greatest strength. The thing that has got us all of these wonderful advantages is also the thing that's so easy to kind of tear down from from the opposing side. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. It's it's a challenge because um, I think that that folks that, that don't want to accept the the science behind climate change, um, you know, really take advantage of the fact that um, science uh, always will have a certain level of uncertainty surrounding it and. It's not uncertainty like like how you and I like on the street would talk about uncertainty, but it actually has like mathematical um, concepts surrounding uncertainty with error bars and so on. And 
And I think what people don't recognize is like it's the same level of uncertainty that goes into you getting surgery, you taking medicine, cures for cancer, um, our, our theories of, of gravity, our theories of evolution and the cell and so on. And so they're using the same exact science for all these different things and yet people are perfectly willing to accept the science when it's going to cure um, cancer for them. I mean, who wouldn't, you know? Uh, but they're less likely to accept it when it maybe doesn't fit into what they perceive as their political or social perspective. And that's really troubling and I think that has a lot to do with our education model where we're not really pushing that forward where it, the same level of uncertainty goes into all these different components of science. Yeah, it's almost like there's like a base level of of rationalism and evidence based observation of the world and being able to kind of work within that framework and then to kind of extend that outward into into the other things you're going to see in the news and so on. I mean, you know, in many cases, like when I see, I don't know, there was recent research that uh, what multivitamins now are bad for you, you know, and so <laughs> anyone who ever told me that multivitamins were good for me, you know, I'd be like, well, how sure are you, and how do you know, and what's the model, and how big was the, yeah. how big was the sample size, and you know, how many mm -hmm. nurses, you know, <laughs> over how many decades were were taking these multi, so so you know, for me, whenever I see a piece of research and someone saying I should do something or not do something, I have this, I have a kind of a natural skepticism. And, and and the same thing goes even when you know when people say well you know uh, you, you know we all should have that natural skepticism but then that natural skepticism should be worn down with overwhelming evidence and so, and I think one of the things that you just with without labeling it brought up was statistics people don't have an inherent understanding of statistics I I know it, it's one of those things that I really struggled with in my math classes. And it's it's one thing to tell someone that when they go, they're going into surgery, they have a 30% chance of this really bad thing happening. Well, that doesn't mean that if you have the same surgery three times, you're guaranteeing that bad thing will happen. Um, and and things like that are just very hard to wrap your head around. And people um, will jump from saying that one in four is absolutely terrible odds because uh, it's probably going to, the bad thing's probably going to happen to one in four is great odds. The good thing that that one in four is probably going to happen. We self-select how to understand the statistics. And, and you're laughing, and, and so this must be something that you deal with all the time, Minda. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you were just bringing up the, exactly the core issue, right? Um, is that how many people buy a lottery ticket, and how many of those people are willing to believe, uh, to understand and, and the the science behind climate change or this or any component of science, you know? And so it's always interesting the way that I think um, people run numbers in their heads and their understanding of it and their willingness to accept um, one component or, or one scientific issue. Um, related to the numbers and not necessarily another one. So what can, I mean, we, we've, we've talked about this a bit beforehand uh, on like sort of what we can do. Um, you know, what do you think is a sort of reasonable response at this point? I mean, you know, in the worst case scenario, right, then uh, the temperatures will rise and uh, all humanity will die and the uh, about 300 years or so down the road, yeah. you know, the carbon dioxide will be sort of removed from the system again because it's, you know, it's naturally being mm -hmm. produced by humans and eventually be removed. So I think, you know, as a baseline, the, you know, the, the bacteria can rise again and and take over. But, you know, you know, this is really about human, about us saving the environment that we enjoy, that we live in, that we want to be a part of, and the you know the world that we have right now. So, what can we do to sort of you know realistically now at this point? You know, this is interesting because this was a big conversation at this this conference that I was at last week. Again, with with researchers and communicators and educators all came together to think, what do we need to do? And the thing that it really came down to is that um, first and foremost, we need we need everyone on board understanding the science, understanding the consequences, understanding fundamentally what is going on. And we've just been really lacking with the educational component of it. And it's not to say that people haven't tried, um, but, but we're way behind where we need to be. And it's fundamentally really unfair to kids today, not knowing what they're going to have to deal with when they're older. That's, that's completely unfair. That's I mean, what we need first. And once we have all of that, then we can um, have a conversation about what needs to happen. Do we need to do policy? Do we need to do more energy efficiency? 
Do we need to fundamentally restructure our infrastructure? I don't have the answer to that, but we need to have that conversation. And in order to do that, we need the education. Like, but 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 isn't isn't this you know what you're describing? Isn't that the conversation? You know, that would have been a good plan thirty years ago, right? I mean, yeah. we're you know now we're at the four hundred parts per million. When will we hit five hundred? When will we hit six hundred? I mean, yeah, I mean, if we the amount of greenhouse gases is still increasing, right? Uh, it is all the time, but you know the reality is we can't change the the past, but we can always change the future. And so we could spend a lot of time saying, well, it's too late now. <laughs> yeah, and, and we have to be the attention that it, it, we have to pay attention to the fact that it's not just carbon dioxide. Uh, methane, which is rela released during fracking, uh, is also a greenhouse gas. Water is also a greenhouse gas, and we end up with, uh, well, water vapor increasing in the atmosphere as the planet's temperature increases. So we have this twofold problem of as the planet's temperatures increase, we have the oceans expanding and the humidity levels in the atmosphere increasing, and this leads to a double whammy of runaway greenhouse effect uh, that causes the oceans to expand and evaporate more and takes over the shores and, uh, yeah, death. <laughs> well, well, then let's move into, I, mean, I guess I kind of feel like you know, a lot of these kind of policies and slow decreases and everybody agreeing and let's have some of the chords and stuff. I mean, that has really been tried and I feel like, you know, history will tell us what will happen in the future if people, you know, as long as there's still this really organized lobby that is attempting to, you know, throw confusion mm -hmm. and doubt and so on. And it, and, it, and it almost starts to feel like the only way to get off of carbon as a sort of fuel source is is for some, or hydrocarbons, is for some, you know, new technology to sort of undercut it financially so that it makes sense with people's pocketbooks to start moving to other forms of energy and other forms of, of fuel. And unfortunately, those haven't come online, you know, the renewable resources, solar, tidal, wind, those just haven't been coming online fast enough, right? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, that's all part of the, the conversation that needs to be happening. There isn't necessarily one solution, and I think that that's really important to remember. So we actually, and this was sort of passed over in the media a little bit, but we've actually uh, this year have our, our greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. at 1990 levels. So if you remember the Kyoto Protocol, that was the goal of the Kyoto Protocol, which um, the U.S. refused to sign because we said it would kill the economy. And now, as it turns out, you know, we did have a recession which forced people to really rethink their use of energy and, and energy efficiency and that sort of thing. But as we're coming out of it, the stock market is like doing incredible right now. It's just completely booming. And yet our greenhouse gas emissions are, are much lower than they have been in the past. And so this whole, uh, you know, it has to be one thing or it'll be really damaging to the economy and so on. What's happened is we haven't done just one thing. We've done multiple little things that have really had a large impact. And maybe that's what the conversation needs to be ha had for the future. If we understand the science behind it, if we understand the economics, if we understand all the components, we can have that kind of conversation with, look how well we've done. Let's keep moving forward. And, no. and this, this is where um, this, this is so important because we've only got one Earth. And we've only got one chance. I, Fraser always talks about, well, the, the microbes will come back, but we've used up a lot of our world's resources. And while I foresee us being able to find ways to get around this with technology, a new civilization starting from scratch wouldn't have that ability. We're running out of helium of all the crazy things to have to worry yeah. about. But running out of helium, that's going to have detrimental effects on, on medical research, on a lot of, of science, on high energy physics. Um, we uh, have used up the easily accessible petroleum and coal resources, the easily accessible mineral resources. And so a new civilization trying to start over will have no helium balloons. Um, but we'll also have a great deal of difficulty getting started as uh, first a metalworking society and then a combustible society. Um, so we need to get it right and we yeah. need to eventually get off the earth so that we can go take advantage of resources elsewhere. <laughs> now, now what do you think about both the sort of feasibility of some of the geoengineering uh, ideas that have been proposed? You know, um, for examples like uh, dumping uh, vast uh, tanker loads of iron into the ocean to try and 
sort of encourage plankton blooms or to uh, cut down gigantic forests and just bury the trees. Yeah, that I mean, there are a lot. There's a lot of research that goes into it, and a lot of ideas and that sort of thing. And and again, I I don't have the answer. There are some folks who are are big supporters of that. Um, my organization doesn't have a position on it. Um, of course, the the whole the whole thing that I always come back to is you know personally, and I'm not saying this as my from my organization, but from my own perspective, is that you have to remember the cane toads. So I don't know if you heard the story of the cane toads being brought to Australia, and they were going to be great because they were going to eat all the um, eat all the insects, and and it was sort of this bio um, um, pesticide, if you will, where you bring in the frogs and they eat the insects and so on. And uh, they, they became an invasive species, and they took off, and they started eating all the, the plants, and now, like, you, you can't get rid of the cane toads and so on. And so you always have to be cognizant and careful of that with any sort of large-scale solution that you don't know all of the impacts and all of the different pieces that are going to come together. And, yeah, maybe you're going to do something great, but also you have to be aware of when you're, you're playing with a system that you don't fully understand. I want a series of volcanoes to go off in places <laughs> that are are not under major air paths. Okay. Mm, you want <laughs> volcanoes exploding. I, I'm, I'm a fan of volcanoes. Go volcanoes. <laughs> all right, all right. That's your geoengineering method is for us to drop a bunch of, you know, bombs down. No, no, no. The planet Earth yellow. can do this for herself. No, no. We got to accelerate. We got we to gotta manipulate it. We'll drop a bunch of nuclear bombs down into, like, some, some magma dome. Yeah, you've been watching uh, Pierce Bronson movies again. Yeah, this is, this is how we will combat climate change. And pay me one billion dollars. Uh, no. <laughs> so, so, so we're we're recording this episode of Astronomy Cast during the CosmoQuest 24-hour hangout, which is actually 32 hours long because, like any good four uh, four book trilogy, we could not be confined by our name. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to be transitioning into our next segment, and before we do that, uh, Minda, it, it's been fabulous having you here, and I'd love love to know what is that one talking point you'd love everyone in our audience to walk away with well I have to say that you know students kids everyone has a right to know about what's going on we're doing them a major disservice right now by not even teaching them the science not giving them information about what climate change is and what the impacts are we have to start there and from there we can actually have an adult conversation about what to do about it Fantastic. Well, Minda, thank you very much for joining us on, on Astronomy Cast. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for having me. I, I do want to share one comment from YouTube first, since you brought up the cane t toads. Uh, you'd say, oh my God, uh, writes, it's legal to own a cane toad, but it's illegal to lick it in Florida. <laughs> So, there you have it. <laughs> there, there you have there you it. And, and, and our friend Steve DeGroff said at the beginning of the recording, I, I love this comment. It says something about all of us podcasters. He says, I was sitting here being very quiet because Pamela and Fraser are recording. Derp, he's watching us online. Yeah. <laughs> Emily Emily Fink uh, says, did Pamela and Fraser just admit that they're supervillains? Uh, Emily, if you have heard any of our astronomy cast, you know, mad, gigantic schemes is really half of where I think about things. Yeah. So if you go to astrogear.org, we have posters and T-shirts in very limited sizes, admittedly, uh, that say the world is trying to kill you. The universe a, is trying to kill the us. The universe yeah. is trying to kill you with a fabulous illustration from Chris yeah. Spangler. And, um, yeah, the world is trying to kill you. Yeah, it certainly um, is. <laughs> So, All right. And, and uh, Graham had to leave for a while. Thank you for being here. Uh, but Minda, thank you. This has been fabulous. And don't let cane toads in Florida. Don't let cane toads. All right. And don't let the climate deniers get you down. Uh, Fight. Thank you. Bye. See you later. <laughs> bye bye. Uh, well, you should push the donate. We should do tell people to donate. Yes, yes. So, uh, whoa. <laughs> Sleepy Nicole <laughs> moved and killed a microphone. Uh, so, so this is the CosmoQuest 24-hour, 32-hour long hangout to raise money to support our education and citizen science initiatives through Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. You can make a tax deductible where the law allows a donation to what we're doing at CosmoQuest.org slash donate. Uh, last I looked, we'd raised uh, a little over $13,000 dollars 
years. Uh, we set an initial goal that we, we figured was impossible goal, but we like to try to do the impossible um, of, of trying to raise six months worth of funding. Uh, we're not going to hit our goal of $200,000, but we like to dream big and, you know, at this point, let's see if we can hit 10% of that maybe today. Uh, we're at 13724 right now. Um, and the reason we're trying to do this fundraising is because our government is in the process of, of perhaps restructuring how we do science education and if that happens we're gonna have all of our funding zeroed and while uh, the various agencies wait to see what the government does with its funding for science education and research uh, we are facing cutbacks already we are facing uh, grants that we would normally apply for don't even exist this year um, at least not yet and this means we're going to have a gap in our funding while we look to find new funding. We estimate that gap could be six months long and the people who are going to be most effect by, affected by it are myself, I'll drop down to being only funded one day a week, and our two programmers who will lose all of their funding. So we need your help uh, to keep our programmers and me employed. Um, so anything helps. Um, five dollars ten dollars we're encouraging people to donate their Starbucks fund or their junk food fund and now you're um, taking bitcoins we do take bitcoins as well bitcoins nice. go to astrosphere but I will be donating the equivalent amount of money in supplies to our teacher training programs over at SIUE um, and and you can help and um, yeah, sharing is caring. Even if you don't have a dollar or a bitcoin to share, we get that. That's okay. Come join us. Do science. And if you can retweet and get one more person in here clicking craters on the moon, listening and learning through our many different new media activities, um, that's progress. We want to build a solid community. And, and Fraser? Oh, I was just going to say, Pamela, that you were entirely vindicated. I, I, I sort of said, I, you know, I decided that you probably wouldn't be super cogent after 24 hours of, <laughs> of uh, doing a live 24-hour uh, broadcast. And actually, I got to say, your brain is still uh, mostly there. <laughs> I can see a few cracks in the arm, and I'm not going to push. But, uh, but I think you're doing fantastic. So congratulations on And I now have a plump. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, so, so I don't know where all the fresh fruit is coming from, but but my house, which is normally a place of triscuits and hummus, has become a place with fresh grapes and a plum. Um, Somebody so. is trying to keep you sort of healthy. Yes. Um, so do we have Matt Kaplan, Nicole? I sent an invite. Okay, I'm going to actually switch around to the other side of the desk so we can unmute Nicole and she and I are going to go back to using our uh, other set of microphones, which is the old uh, Travel Astronomy Cast set of microphones. I don't so remember. So you're going to move? Yeah, I'm just walking around the desk though. Okay, go. <laughs> Let me see if there's any questions that I need to... Uh... Dale Jacobs notes, uh, like Matt, you go, go. Uh, <laughs> like Mao ordered all the sparrows to be killed, they were eating seeds, and then the locusts came and ate all the crops. So that's sort of back to that sort of, you know, unintentional, uh, unintentional invasive species. We actually have blackberries here. I don't know if you guys have them a lot in the yeah, United we, States. We have blackberries in our backyard. Yeah, so we have these. They're I think they're from Nepal, and they're everywhere, and they're. The blackberries are delicious. I'll admit that, but the, <laughs> but they're just these. You know, they consume vast chunks of land with these gigantic, oh, you know, tangled, vine. thorny vines. Uh, we've got, um, uh, what are they? Starlings. We have clouds of starlings, which oh are an, an invasive yes, species. Yeah, they're they're just there. terrible. Um, yeah, and then the one that's really we have a big problem with here on Vancouver Island. I don't know if you guys have it there. It's broom. It's a European uh, sort of like a it's a shrub with this these bright yellow flowers and the stuff is just taking over the whole island and so people go out at the right time you kill broom in bloom so every spring people go on these big work parties and cut this stuff down and and kill it because it's just it's just all over the place like we apparently clearly have the perfect environment for this stuff so 
and again, I think that started with somebody going, wouldn't it be great if I had this flower, that this shrub that reminds me of home? Yeah, well, we all get it now. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. So I, I know how people uh, occasionally say to you, oh, I like Astronomy Cast so much, I fall asleep while listening to it. Oh, my gosh. I never understood that. Because, yes, you have a soothing, great radio voice, but I don't know. I never made me sleepy, but uh, oh, I can staying tell up you. for 25, 26 hours, I would be able to. <laughs> <laughs> we put the cold to the cold sleep. sleep for the first time the ever. Victory. Yeah, I no, you know what? I the way down so I can only hear Pamela. <laughs> you know, I, you know, when we get that comment, and we seriously get that all the time, oh, I, uh, I never got it. You no, know, well, I get it. I get it. Come on, you I can just don't. listen to Pamela talk. Just like, oh, she's so soothing. But um, <laughs> you guys were talking about horrible, horrible things. I know, I know. She's like, oh, tell me more about the end of everything. <laughs> so I, I'm pretty sure I probably had the most devastated eyebrow crinkle the entire episode, just because it's, it, like I said, it's one of those topics that. That people who love love me took climate science away, because <laughs> yeah, I worst case things. So yeah. I um I sent Matt Kaplan an invite in Google Plus and a link in the email. So on, check Matt. that out. I know you're a pro, so we did also we well we may have had the green room open. I don't know, my <laughs> laptop froze. <laughs> so. Oh, so Jeff Bohr says Scotch broom. They used to make actual brooms of it. There you go. Um, oh, uh, so Jeff says plug the cat the class you two will be doing in August. It's it's not a you two, it's a Pamela. Yeah. Um, I don't volunteer Fraser for things that take that many hours. Um, so I I'm going to be teaching a class for CosmoQuest in August. I scheduled three sections. Um, all the money that you pay in tuition for this program, I am not taking one dime of it. I'm reinvesting all of that money into growing Cosmo Academy. Um, it will go into uh, salaries for our staff. And um, so the class is going to be on the Big Bang and the Big Dark Future, how the universe will end. Uh, it's going to start August 12th. There are sections at... Uh, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Pacific, and 6 p.m. Pacific. It's four classes. Each class is uh, one hour in duration. And um, I tried to scatter it out so that hopefully most of you could find um, a section that halfway met your time zone. Um, so please sign up. It's a great way to learn and to give all at the same time. So. Uh, you can learn well and do good all at the same time. That sounds fantastic. That's like my favorite topic. <laughs> Sign up for the class. <laughs> well, no, I got to leave a slot open for somebody else. I, you know, and I've already had a, a education from Pamela in a, uh, <laughs> Seriously. yeah, in a two episode uh, series we called the uh, End of Everything, which is in Astronomy Cast. That Possibly. was the saddest one ever. Yeah. That made me want to just like lie in a depressed ball of depression. I know. <laughs> it was so bad. Right, yeah. Like, yeah we the... giggle while we do it. I know. I, know. <laughs> I think that if you had been doing video at the time, there would have been a worry brow. Worry brow. <laughs> yeah. I could, I, could, I could hear it in your voice. <laughs> the They're all just brow. these sort of, you know, intellectual concepts at this point. It's really hard to sort of imagine, you know, reality. Um, so if Matt doesn't show up, though, uh, we can absolutely take on this topic between the two of us uh, with Nicole as well, which is yeah, great. Yeah, totally. I'm a third wheel. Third wheel. <laughs> <laughs> you are not a third wheel. <laughs> Tell you what, Pamela can go have a nap, and Nicole and I will handle this topic. Right, I'm yeah. fine. I know you are. What the? What are you carved from a block of solid granite? What oh, is? Oh, she took. She took a thirty. She took two thirty-minute naps. I took two thirty-minute two 30 naps. naps. Yeah. And a little power naps. And some speed. No, <laughs> no. Um, I'm... AKA cookies. Cookies, yeah, that's true. right. I, did do. I, I thought there was just fruit there. Now I see cookies. Well, yeah, that's because we we actually so our our significant others who have been supporting us through this, um, they uh, provided us fruit 
And then we realized, oh, expletive, we need cookies for one of our science demos. And so the only reason we have cookies is because I insisted on doing geologic experiments with cookies to explain various faulting. Yeah, we sent Tim to the grocery store at some god awful hour of the morning to get 7.30 <laughs> in the morning. Now, have there been some awesome highlights of the, uh, of the Hangout-a-thon so far? Is there some stuff that people should like go back and you know, watch again? The highlight reel so far. I totally bombed at some point. <laughs> my nap. <laughs> <laughs> totally when nap. when we were doing the uh, painting space clothing, I think that was perhaps the most roller coaster hour because I was here by myself while while Nicole took a nap, and the comment tracker crashed, and I didn't realize it had crashed. I thought that people had simply oh, stopped no. talking oh. to me, <laughs> and so I was getting progressively more sad. Oh. <laughs> That must be when Michael messaged and, you because yeah. my head started vibrating because my phone was next to it. So he was messaging you saying, "Hey, do you need help?" Yeah. Well, so he was messaging me. No, no, no. It's okay. Everything's good. People are people are commenting, and so then I realized comment tracker had crashed, and I was forlorn. And Michael joined oh. me, and I recycled the window so I could see people's comments again. And then it was then it probably joy and goodness. Um, yeah. yeah. And and uh, so you I people are awesome. It's the common checker that's it be. <laughs> um, so so that was an emotional roller coaster for me going from I've been abandoned and I'm painting the Pleiades by myself to wait, everyone's still there. Okay, you're just not donating money, which is more forgivable. <laughs> <laughs> don't leave me. No, no don't, don't leave me. me. <laughs> I was alone on the internet. That's not supposed to happen. Oh, uh, so we have a Matt Avatar. Matt Vatar. Matt. We do. We do. We're starting to get Matt. And I will say the Warner Von Brahms all the way down. Yeah. Has Amy responded to that yet? That someone has delivered her yes, her vision of the future. On okay. Good. Good. Yeah, Matt. We can hear you, but we cannot see you. I can't hear him. Well, I heard him before, but it was kind of low. That's why I was going shh, because our speakers are shh, shh. Yeah, we can't hear them at all. <laughs> yeah. Matt. Don't. Um, refresh the window. Hit reload. Kick it. Turn it off. Turn it on. Unplug. Plug in. Unplug. Plug in. Reinstall. Reboot. There. Retry. There it is. Oh, now we can't hear you. You're muted, You're Matt. You're auto muted. You gotta unmute yourself. Still muted. Top right, the little mic, your phone button, it should be red. We heard and, you. And I think the other moment of glory of this hangout. We can't hear you. We can't Matt. hear you. We, we heard you before, but we couldn't see you. Now we can see you, but we can't hear you. We had that with one of the He's working on there. it. Just reload again. Refresh again. <laughs> so, so I think one of the other moments of glory of the hangout was Nicole and I were getting gradually hotter <gasps> and hotter. And I finally stood over and went to look at the air conditioning unit, which, which is a portable indoor one that exhausts out through the window. Um, and the exhaust had popped out of the window and was actually heating the attic instead of cooling the attic. And so I'm like, like smelled like burning air. <laughs> and, and so I'm like trying to shove it back into the the wall that back into the hole that my husband had kind of hacked, um, because instead of using the vent that comes with the air conditioner that doesn't oh. fit fit in our house's windows, he tried to build one himself. And it just wasn't working. It kept popping out. There was at least a roll of duct tape involved in trying to fix it. And for the first time ever, duct tape failed. And Joe, our programmer, our awesome programmer, came up, looked at it, said, no. <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> and he disappears. And I hear the table saw. <laughs> and 20 minutes later, the temperatures are dropping because they fixed the vent for the air conditioner. And now Nicole has resorted to going and finding a hoodie. You know what? I, I think I think my body's just shutting down, and it doesn't matter what temperature it is. And I was shivering. Uh, Dusty pointed out that people should watch Wiggle Time. So oh around yes. Around 3 a.m., we were talking to Dark Skies Bright Kids, and talking about the concept of using Wiggle Time to get the elementary school kids to get the wiggles out before they sit down and talk about astronomy. And, it works and on postdocs and grad students too. Right. <laughs> and I, I can, like a third grader. So I can see and hear Matt.